Hello, everybody, and um, ha happy St. Patrick's okay, Day. Um, <laughs> in honor of this day, we have um, a speaker and uh, book artist, Anne Greenwood. Oh. So she <laughs> carries her colors with her. Um, Anne is an interdisciplinary artist who lives now in Portland, though she came from the uh, Dakota High Plains. Um, she works in probably every media I can think of except sound. Mm -hmm. um, but she is an extraordinary artist uh, both in um, book art, in um, tapestry, um, any kind of textiles, in um, public art, um, and a lot of community work. Mm -hmm. So I think you will have mm -hmm. a wonderful time hearing from her. And Thank you, Cynthia. You're welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think I see a couple people that I met when I was here last. I was up here in November uh, with a colleague of mine, Diane Jacobs, um, while she talked about her work. Um, so today I'm going to start with uh, talking a little bit about my um, history uh, as an artist. Um, I didn't come to book arts um, right away. That has taken me some time to find. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, I grew up in the Midwest in North Dakota. Um, graduated from my undergraduate in 1990 with uh, a degree that was more photography based. Um, I did do some interdisciplinary work. Um, you know, taking photographs and working with alternative processes, working with cyanotype and liquid light and some of those processes. Uh, but I moved to uh, Portland, Oregon in um, 1990 and, um, you know, with a bachelor's degree in art um, right out of college, I, I started working as a, a gardener. I started working um, tending people's gardens and working in public gardens. As I had grown up with a, a father who was um, working for the Fish and Wildlife Service, so I learned a lot about the natural world through him, and that was my connection coming to Portland. Um, I also sought out opportunities to work photogra photographically, and one of the first connections I made was with a, um, a photographer named Thomas Robinson. And we started working together. He was uh, collecting historical negatives at the time, and we traveled around the state, and he purchased collections of glass plate negatives from photographers who had been itinerant in the area. And so this is some of the early work we did together where, um, you know, these were glass plate negatives. Um, this collection was um, Rufus Heck, who photographed a lot of um, Eastern Oregon, Pendleton area. Um, he also did uh, portraiture. Um, and so these were all, um, you know, large format negatives that we printed in a traditional darkroom setting. Um, and then we would travel to these locations and meet with people in the area to try and learn more about the photographer and the work. Um, so. You know, a lot of my work is still portrays an interest in history, and this early um, photographic connection with Tom was really exciting for me. Um, some of the the photographs are just oh, real geez. unusual, um, and uh, I learned a lot about the history of Oregon in this process. Um, so we started just as an informal group at the time called the, the Photo Research Group. And um, I worked with Tom uh, for probably eight years, um, primarily doing research and darkroom work. And he now has a company called um, 
historic photo archive and he still prints um, mostly digital now but he supplies historical photographs for all sorts of different applications um, so around the time I finished working with him I um, I had my first daughter so that was 1998 um, and at that time um, I moved out of working with chemicals and darkroom work and, um, and moved into doing more uh, textiles work, more fabric work. Um, my neighbor at the time was a uh, restored tapestries and quilts and uh, she and I were getting together and um, she was planning to move out of town and shared with me kind of uh, her studio, invited me in to choose whatever I needed because she was moving on to other things. So around 1990, 1998, 99, I set up a, a studio in my home that was more textiles based. Um, and one of the first books I made prior to that, you know, I, I didn't know that there was a field within art called book arts at that time. Even though I was living in Portland where the Oregon College of Arts and Crafts was training people to be book artists. Um, but I made this little tiny book called Old Work and Tools of the Trade. I had purchased a, I think it's called a sinograph. It's just a tabletop, um, sign making press with a press bed just a little bit larger than this and I had worked in linoleum carving before but this allowed me to set a little bit of type um, and so I made this for a collaborative exhibit called multiple miniatures where seven artists made editions of seven pieces that were under the dimensions of seven by seven. And so these are all linoleum carvings, um, referencing tools and old work. Um, at the time I made this, I was working full time as a, uh, a gardener. And so, um, all of my artwork was kind of a weekend project. Um, yeah, so this was my first, my first book, and uh, since since then I've learned that this is this is not a great way to bind a book because <laughs> you can't really look at it very easily. Um, but it served that purpose, um, and so. Um, after that, I started, um, you know, I had a young daughter at home, was transitioning uh, to staying at home for the most part, and started a, a home, kind of a stitching group with uh, women in the neighborhood, women and men. Um, and we got together once a week and um, were just getting together kind of to talk and spend time together. But that is where... Um, I really started delving into textiles more and um, and came up with the idea for my second book which was called Winter Count and um, I'm going to send around a, a photograph of the project. These are um, hand embroidered pieces on uh, linen. Um, I generally work with repurposed materials, um, linen, cotton, wool, um, and the reason this is called winter count is um, traditionally the Plains Indians used a calendar that they called a winter count to record a memory or an event from each passing year so that they could have a sort of a mnemonic device, an image that um, led to a story that told the history of their people. And so these are, um, I can pass these around too, these are the, the individual embroideries that I made. Um, 
there are, I believe there's 40 of them. Mm -hmm. I used one image for each year of my life um, and stuck with sort of a format that you can see where they're same color, um, each year is the same color and different types of stitches. Um, and then they're mounted on Douglas fir. Uh, my husband Mauricio is in the back of the room. He's a woodworker and he, he frames a lot of my work and helps me find solutions for exhibiting. Yeah. And so these are sewn. Uh, you can see in the back there's little holes drilled and they're sewn on with uh, uh, monofilament wire or monofilament thread. Um, and so um, at that same time, I um, had met several other artists in Portland. Um, one of the gardens that I was working in at the time was, a, was what's called a community-supported agriculture project. It was a small city garden, and um, we would grow food there for people in the neighborhood or open the garden and have... Um, you know, Saturday sales. And I met a couple of artists there. I met Helen Hebert there, who lived in the neighborhood, and she's a paper maker and book artist. And she invited me to join her and Diane Jacobs and Shuju Wang and several other artists that were starting to get together on a monthly basis to just brainstorm ideas and talk about process and um, and so I started meeting with them, and they inspired me to take these embroidery pieces that I was making and translate them into a book. Um, and so this is, you know, I went from making this to making this, <laughs> which to me, I learned a lot in this process. And, um, you know, working with... Um, several other women who had been trained as book artists and really knew all the different processes that were traditionally related to that work. Um, so this is what I call a portfolio of prints. Um, and this, um, at the same time I met um, Inga Brugman, who was teaching at Oregon College of Arts and Crafts, who's also a book artist. She had a press called Textura Letter Press, and I collaborated with her on all the printing of this book. She uh, made polymer plates for me um, and did some handset type. I'll pass this around. Uh, this has a quote from Barry Lopez from his book called Winter Count. Um, and then it, it talks a little bit about the, the project itself. And so the embroideries that I'm passing around were all um, individually scanned um, and then polymer plates. Inga made polymer plates of each one and we came as close as we could to matching the color to the actual embroideries and um, imprinted this edition of, um, of years um, from my life. Uh, and so they each are, are marked with the year in the, in the corner. Um, and this one has always been hard to see. Um, but, uh, what paper it, are those on? Pardon me? What paper are those on? They're on Fabriano Rosaspina. Yeah. Uh, so Inga really walked me through um, a lot of the the letterpress process. She we we consulted um, pretty closely on paper and size and um, all sorts of those <coughs> considerations. Um, and then um, the last couple pages are uh, a list of the stitches and the titles of the different works um, and the colophon. Um, yeah, so this was, 
this really introduced me to kind of the formal world of, of book arts. Um, working with Diane and um, Shuju and Helen, um, you know, I think Diane was mostly working in book arts, but um, Helen had yet to kind of begin her career as a book artist too. So it was, uh, it was very inspiring for all of us to meet on a regular basis. We probably met, um, we still see each other. Helen moved to Colorado, but we still see each other. And we met, um, you know, every month for probably uh, seven or eight years and mm -hmm. exhibited. Um, we started collaborating together. Um, we made another piece, um, let me see. Um, we made a, a project together called All About Food. And I don't have this piece, it was a, it was a one of a kind. Um, but we made an exhibit together, an installation that was a tabletop. And my piece was a fabric book that was a place setting. We each made a different place setting. <coughs> And so this book kind of went through um, the different courses of a meal mm -hmm. on each page. And it was called The Fear and um, the Pleasure of Food. Mm -hmm. And it is on my website if people want to see that. Um, and um, at that time, I also started doing quite a few community projects. Um, I was working. Um, with some of the local schools and um, and started doing some teaching and I made this this next book which is is a self-published book that is documents um, the project that I did with the students and um, this project was bringing in um, another Native American concept which was kind of the cycles of life called Lost Harmonies. And um, the students and I, I think it was mi uh, middle school students, we went to the art museum, we went to Helen's paper making studio, we went to a print making studio. Um, and the students all learned about these different processes. And then we, um, we made some tapestries on um, Tyvek which they illustrated, um, you know, breaking into four groups, four cycles of life, different groups of students working on each tapestry, translating their ideas about that cycle. And then I went through and cut out, um, uh, I'll show you one of the images here. I made four um, prints that uh, mirrored that project, the tapestry that the kids did, and then um, made wooden templates and folded up the tapestries and cut out these images. Um, I'll pass this around so you can take a closer look. And local artist Rebecca Wild, who I think now lives up in this area, she was down in Portland, but she's a calligrapher. She um, took quotes from the book called, um, oh, what is it called? Um, let me look here. It is uh, Language of the Birds. Um, and so she took uh, poems from that book and paired them with the different cycles of life and, um, uh, you know, worked in calligraphy on the opposing side of the tapestry that the kids worked on. So this was also one of my introduction, introductions to working with students in school, bringing art projects into the classroom. Um, and at the same time, I was, um, uh, you know, staying at home, not working as much as a gardener, not working professionally in that capacity. Um, there, I, I was living in a, in a, a changing neighborhood. Uh, when my husband and I bought our house, um, 
I think in 1996, it was condemned and it was in a, you know, neighborhood that had been neglected, marginalized. Um, and so there were, there were a lot of vacant lots that, um, you know, community development corporations were, were grabbing up and, and building, um, you know, multiple condos. And um, so at that time, uh, there was a, a small parcel of, la of land close to our house that a couple of community members got together and said, you know, can't we turn this into a little park? Does it have to have three condos on it? Mm -hmm. And so we uh, formed a, a small group and approached Portland Parks and Recreation and a couple of city agencies and got this piece of land set aside um, as a small park. And um, it's called the Albina Green. And so I spent many years writing grants um, to uh, turn this neglected tax foreclosed piece of property into a small public community green space. And over the course of, let's see, this started in 1998. And um, in 2016, uh, we were awarded a Portland Deve Development Commission Community Livability Grant to, to transform kind of the work that we originally did, um, which was you know, plant grass and um, create a walkway through the park and put up a small fence and several large rocks into the park. Um, and this time around, we opened the park up and created what you can see here, which is a little grass stage for musicians and theater performance and kind of improvisational events to occur in the city. And so this is ongoing. I mean, this is something that I will probably work on forever because <laughs> I've been a part of the, the initial process of um, securing the land for the community. And, um, you know, we started out with a mural that students painted, and we've since transitioned into a a mural that was funded through the Regional Arts and Culture Council mm -hmm. and professional artists, um, Chris Johansson and Joanna Jackson came in and painted that in, um, I think it was 2013 maybe. Um, yes? Where in Portland is it? It is in North Portland. It's on the corner of Albina and Sumner streets. Um, and it's quite small. It's, um, I think I have the, the dimensions here. Um, yeah, it's um, 3,552 square feet. So, you know, we do events now, like the Portland Art Museum will, um, you know, put a screen on the wall in front of the mural and show open air films over the summer. Um, different groups gather there for anything from like a garage sale to um, like what is that concert, concert. Um, there's this group I can't remember what it is it's like a, a group of red-headed people that <laughs> gather together I think they call themselves like the gingers or I, I'm not sure what it is but I have a photograph of probably a hundred red-haired people gathered in the park. So, you know, it's, it's great that it's kind of taken on a life of its own. You know, we tried at first to, you know, stage events there, and it's just been fun to see the community take it over and do what they like there. Um, yeah, so that is something that I continue to work on. Um, I think my next book project was um, was a smaller project. Um, I was invited to uh, create work. A friend of mine was living in LA at the time and she was curating an exhibit called Soft. Um, it needed to be work that could 
hang on the wall. And um, so I came up with an idea for a book that could hang on the wall. This is an edition of three books called Blow Me Away. And it is a pocket book um, that the strings untie. And it has two grommets here that the, the bias tape goes through. And then on the inside is a little bit of rabbit fur. So you get to stick your hand in there and feel the rabbit fur. And then there's a small book, um, screen printed linen. Um, with hand embroidery, the title page. Um, and this is just a, a very simple story of, um, I'm sure you're all getting the idea here, <laughs> the seeds dispersing from a dandelion. And um, it was a I think because of the title, it, um, it made me start thinking about um, creating a tactile work um, that uh, was simple and, um, and just really, um, you know, alluded to um, kind of childhood for me, which was full of sensations. Um, uh, you know, like my my father used to carry these, you know, part of his uniform was blue Levi's and a red bandana mm -hmm. hanky that he kept in his pocket. And so, um, you know, growing up in the country um, and learning a lot of the plants and weeds, um, this piece kind of came together as just a simple reference to childhood um, experiences. And I'll pass this around for you all. Um, and so the grommets um, hang on hooks on the wall. And so then you can, you know, take the book out and page through it that way. Uh -huh. Do you mind if we take photos? No, that's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and please, if there are any questions as I'm talking, let me know. Um, yeah, so the the Blow Me Away was made in 1910, or sorry, 2010. Um, and around that time, I also started looking at um, work by um, the artist Louise Bourgeois, who is amazing um, and works primarily in textiles um, you know she was real inspiring to me so at the same time that I've been making these fabric books I've also been making um, what I call fabric drawings which are you know more two-dimensional works that are um, you know um, sometimes I'll take repurposed materials, which there are so many of, um, linen napkins or dish towels or um, domestic textiles and screen print and overstitch with embroidery. Um, I do a lot of dyeing with natural dyes. In Portland, there's an amazing resource, um, Aurora Silks. Um, a very eccentric master dyer who travels all over the world and collects uh, mostly um, wood fibers that she uses and sells as natural dyes. So I started getting introduced to her, um, her materials and started doing some dyeing um, in silk and uh, silk embroidery thread. Um, silk fabric, um, cotton, wool, um, mostly natural fibers. And uh, that led me to the next book I made, which um, 
is an addition of three. It's called Over and Over. Um, and this is all hand and machine stitched. Um, the cover is an old blanket. Um, the embroidery thread is um, dyed in indigo. Um, and so this is a, at the same time, I, I think it was, um, I don't remember, I think it was Oregon College of Arts and Crafts brought in an embroiderer, um, Tom Lundgren, who teaches in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And at Oregon College of Arts and Crafts, they have, um, you know, amazing facilities, looms and sewing machines. And I was introduced to this Bernina sewing machine, which sews text. It's um, kind of like an, one of those old cell phones where you, you know, you can put in up to 56 characters one at a time, mm -hmm. spacing yeah. in between. <laughs> it's, uh, it's taken me a long time to just be able to focus on remembering all the letters and getting them in. Um, but that's, that's when I acquired this, that sewing machine and started uh, incorporating some text into my work. And so this book, um, I started the year that a very close friend of mine and mentor passed away. The fabrics were um, hers. Uh, and I, like I said, manipulated them with, um, with screen printing and embroidery um, and sewed t all the text along the spine. Um, this is also linen dyed in indigo. Um, and it was this, the last book I showed, The Blow Me Away, and this book that um, I started exploring the the idea of uh, transformation and metamorphosis and taking one shape and changing it and telling a, a simple story through um, changing the shape um, or transitioning an image. Um, and so this is all um, hand sewn, sewn, except for the binding, um, which is machine stitched. And um, yeah, so this is a transformational story. Um, and it took me about four years to make three of these books because I think the, the pro in the process of it, I was kind of coming to terms with this friend of mine passing away and using this process of making a book and stitching as um, part of a therapeutic process. Um, so this is, this is kind of the style of work that I'm, I'm more currently involved in, is, um, is making books that are fabric. Um, mm -hmm. I like to explore the, the methods of translating fabric into printed work, um, like in the winter count, and um, exploring, uh, you know, what other things you can do with fabric, because um, sometimes the textiles processes are so labor intensive, the hand sewing um, that I've, I've constantly been looking for ways to reproduce um, some of the textiles work so you can addition it and so it can reach a wider audience. And so, you know, this, this one piece that you've spent hours and hours and hours laboring on can go to more than just one person or, um, you know, travel a little bit. Um, and, uh, I won't go into my next book, which, um, which entails some of that. I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a great big community project first. Um, 
So let's see, I think it was in um, uh, 2000, um, yeah, um, 2014, um, I had submitted an idea to um, the Portland Community College Cascade Art Gallery for a community project that I was interested in in pursuing. Um, I had always been interested in the feed sacks. Um, you know, this is uh, some work that I collected over the years. These were uh, sugar sacks. They were five pound bags of mm -hmm. sugar that were sold um, during the Depression era with these different mm -hmm. ethnicities of dolls on them that, um, you know, once the sugar was gone, you could um, take apart the, the feed sack and sew together this doll. And uh, so this continues on the on my path of taking historical ideas and translating them into contemporary projects. And what are the dates of these approximate? Yeah, the dates of these, uh, like 1935, 36, yeah. And I was just really intrigued mm -hmm. by how um, ethnicity was conveyed at that time. Um, you know, I think it was a time when, you know, people were more traditional and they were immigrating to the United States and, you know, kind of sticking with their cultures. Not that that doesn't happen now, but um, it was interesting to me that there, there were such stereotypical uh, images of people. <laughs> and so, uh, as I was talking with friends about this, we, we decided, well, let's, let's bring this into the schools. I was awarded the exhibit at PCC, and I collaborated with the draw, one of the drawing teachers at PCC Cascade, and we kind of developed a whole project around this that we called What's in the Bag. And so it was a community-based project where we worked with um, college students at PCC, um, high school students. The, across the street from Portland Community College is Jefferson High School and they had started a new relationship where um, students of Jefferson were starting to go across the street to develop this middle college program where high school students could take classes at the college. And So I was interested in creating relationships within the community um, you know, the feeder schools kind of joining together and students being able to see um, the different schools that they would eventually be going to and, um, and engaging the students in a conversation about identity and how that's changed throughout time. And we made a short um, video kind of describing the project and then we um, had the students um, uh, think about their identities and uh, think about things that people might see just from their appearance and um, things that they felt inside that maybe wouldn't be uh, transparent from just their appearance. And we made a series of, of templates, mm, you know, so that all, student, all ages of students could participate. Um, we made these templates that we handed out. Um, in the schools, they were given out as homework, and students were asked to bring these home and engage with their families and ask if family members would contribute by, you know, um, you know, drawing or coloring an image of, of who they were and then doing a little bit of writing. Um, and so I'll pass some of these around. They're, 
vastly different. It's, it was a really interesting experience to uh, give all ages of people the opportunity to talk about um, mm -hmm. who they were and uh, be real creative about um, what they thought they looked like or uh, um, you know, some people really, really did amazing work. Um, and so, you know, we were in the K through eight um, school in the neighborhood, um, the high school, the community college. We also took the project up to Lewis and Clark College mm -hmm. for the um, for the gender symposium. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also went into a couple of arts-based alternative groups like, um, you know, uh, organizations that worked with street youth or gender transition or um, students that were maybe not in the public schools but that um, were looking for arts activities. Um, so this, this project was ongoing for over a year, um, and the imagery was amazing. Uh, so, so in this time, we learned about a company called Spoonflower, which um, you, know, you can take photographs or draw pictures or design your own wallpaper or your own fabric, and you send them a digital file of whatever it is you want to create, and they will print this out on fabric. So um, we, uh, we then translated these um, drawings into these feed sacks um, that we filled with beans and rice and redistributed to the neighborhood uh, in a small market in the neighborhood. Um, it was, you know, it really was fairly organic. It, um, it evolved as we got into it and sort of midway in the project, um, the school that my daughter was going to, uh, in Portland they had just passed this arts tax, which um, is great for arts and arts education but it excluded middle school students. So I was hired uh, mid-year to do a six-month residency in the middle school and to teach this project to middle school kids every day. So we had to kind of act fast to figure out what the curriculum was going to be and then to really expand the project and, and this is when we started, um, you know, assigning students this assignment and then having them bring it home and engage their family and their community. And uh, the students then um, sewed all these bags together. It became a little bit of like a, a mini sweatshop, you know. <laughs> um, we did all sorts of conversing about identity, um, individual identity, group identity, um, ethnicity, and uh, you know, the students each had a journal and a sketchbook that they kept that they worked in every day. And we explored different elements of art based on, um, you know, what the assignment was. And so we made these linen feed sacks, and uh, this is what they look like, um, filled with, you know, beans and rice. And you can, you'll be able to see when you look at these that, um, you know, the kids hand stitched all of these together. We also asked students to hand embroider on the. Um, the fabric to either accentuate the color or add um, a new layer of image to the design. This, I wanted to make sure I showed you, is um, one of the 
PCC yeah. students. Mm -hmm. So here is his template, and then here's how it translated into a feed sack. And some of these stories are are heartbreaking. I mean, this student um, is is a is a homeless person, and he was you know telling his story um, on the feed sack, and it it gave the teachers real insight into who the students were in a new way that they had yet um, encountered, you know, which was was a, a, a side effect that I hadn't really thought of. When you said that you were putting these out in the, you know, to the community, uh -huh. you had the printed, did, um, for instance, with this person, was that putting was that hard for them to put their own story or their own image out for everyone else to see? Well, or not? Was that not an issue? It didn't seem to be much of an issue. I mean, it must be more of our adult sense of yeah. how to hide that as yeah. opposed to letting well, go. Yeah, well, I mean, part of how it went was, um, you know, we did these in-class activities, and then um, the drawing instructor gave this as an assignment and it was just turned in, mm -hmm. and then the students were invited to the exhibit, mm -hmm. many of whom didn't even come to the exhibit. They just did the work mm -hmm. because it was an assignment, you know? Mm -hmm. And and so uh, most of them are not uh, authored, mm -hmm. you know? There's no name attached to them. But um, we did realize when we were doing some of the kind of icebreaker activities talking about identity that um, that it did bring up some emotion for mm -hmm. people and we learned to be more sensitive to um, just what that might bring up for people and how to be sensitive to um, the different issues that people have around identity um, it's. I feel like it's really come into the forefront of people's awareness now, uh, gender and um, identity, and it's exciting mm -hmm. that it's it's uh, being explored on that level. I think. Um, so these are. I didn't bring these, um, but we made these tapestries of dolls. Um, that uh, so you know we printed the children uh, or the students I should say sewed these bags but we also made a bunch of the dolls too because they were really excited to mm -hmm. see the process through and this is one of the exhibit photographs of um, the different dolls sewed together in a tapestry form here's another image of the exhibit as an installation. Uh, so all of the the templates were hung up on the walls and the tapestries of dolls were hung in the windows. Um, the feed sacks were all piled on top of um, a wooden structure. Um, and then we hosted several embroidery workshops in the gallery where people came in and helped finish some of the work just to have an opportunity to to hear about the the stories and the the process of the project and um, because this this transitioned into an in-school residency we also um, these are pictures of the students working in their sketchbooks we uh, had the opportunity to take this project into a mural design. There was a huge retaining wall. Um, I think it was 10 feet by 100 feet um, that was a courtyard in the, between the schools on the grounds. And it had been um, unpainted uh, for a very long time. And so we took this opportunity to engage the students um, to design imagery for this mural. And so they worked in their sketchbooks and um, 
I'm going to show you some images from their sketchbooks because, as I said, we talked about the identity of place, the identity of individuals, the identity of the community. And then the students just, you know, like they do, um, go off into their own world and create pictures and writing. And so how we decided to um, try to represent this enormous concept was to go through the students' murals, or go through the students' sketchbooks, and um, just do this, uh, photocopy the imagery in a big pile. And we, several artists, professional artists, got together. Um, one of the concepts we discussed was the school was called Beach, um, K-8 school. And so one of the questions was, who is Beach School? And the kids, you know, took that as an assignment. Um, and here was them, the students working together on more of a collaborative identity. They worked in groups and traced the outline of one of their bodies and then um, filled it in with patterns and colors. I'll save this one. Um, here's one of the students sewing feed sacks on the sewing machine. Um, so these images that they created in their journals were then translated into this, this mural. We um, chose different sketches and uh, combined them together um, in this enormous mm. mural. And so the, the photocopies that I have there are some of the specific images and patterns that the, the students created. Um, and then we collaged all that together in this um, mural design which was a really exciting way to work, I felt, was to, um, you know, collaborate with this extensive community and pull all of their work together um, to create a, a piece of finished work. And so the mural is quite large, so the, you can't quite see it, but I'll pass that around. Um, but it was, it was really fun for the kids to see their, you know, like this is the St. John's Bridge in Portland. And it's, you know, represented on the mural. And so the kids were really proud to see something that they did in a little tiny sketch in their sketchbooks translated into a, a you know, permanent mural for the community. Um, so this is a, a, a concept that I've continued to work with in my community work because it's a way of, I find it a way to, to bring people together who don't necessarily, you know, even come into the same room together, but they are all of a sudden collaborating on a project together because um, you know, a concept comes in, they explore it, and then professional artists kind of assemble it into a finished piece of work. So that's, that's something I'm going to continue to work with in, in future projects, um, getting kind of a lot of stuff out here. <laughs> uh, but I want to talk about one more book before my time is up. But please, you know, if anybody wants to see any of this, um, there should be a little bit of time. You mentioned the Seedlewood flower. What kind of flower? F-L-O-W-E-R. Spoon flower. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really 
great company. I am so impressed with them. Yeah. Did the mural go on this building, or is this just them working on? They're the facing the mural, so you can't see. Oh, it's on our side. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought hmm, the bricks. Mm -hmm. Hard to work with. Yeah. Yeah, in Portland, um, at Portland State University, there is, uh, you can get a, a master's degree in something that's called art and social practices, which is a relatively new way of working for artists, which is something that I'm really inspired by. Um, you know, you don't end up authoring necessarily a lot of work. Um, as an individual, but you work together with communities to to bring arts into all sorts of different social contexts. And um, where is that offered again? At Portland State University. Yeah. Um, the last project I'm going to touch on here is. Um, my most recent book um, called Tapestry of Hours. Yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. I actually want to talk about two things. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this next project is called Tapestry of Hours. And, um, was inspired by a conversation I had with uh, Sandra Krupa over at the University of Washington. Um, she and I were, were looking at artists' books together and talking, and, um, and she said, I don't know if you're familiar with the poet Hazel Hall, but she is from Portland. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and you should probably know about her. And I was unfamiliar with her work. But um, when I returned to Portland, I, you know, started researching her work and uh, became inspired by her poetry and um, made this um, portfolio. Again, this is um, uh, this is the original fabric piece. It is. Uh, poetry of Hazel Halls that I cut up into, um, you know, line by line and reassembled in a different form um, using kind of the cut up method of William Burroughs and some of the beat poets of the 60s um, worked with that idea. And so this is some some poetry of Hazel Halls that I uh, programmed into my sewing machine. And this was just kind of a test that I was making to, um, to, to see how I wanted to conceptualize the book. Um, I worked with another artist in Portland, somebody that I met in the What's in the Bag project. She was a student at PCC. Um, an art student, and she had been in a wheelchair for her entire life, um, as had Hazel Hall. Um, and so I reached out to Shannon thinking, maybe we could collaborate on this, because you have such um, experience seeing the world from this vantage point, like Hazel Hall, um, which I don't. and this could potentially bring a unique translation to the book. Um, I don't know if everybody is familiar with Hazel Hall, but she was a poet who moved from Minnesota to Portland. I um, can't remember the year. Um, she was born in 1886. so. Uh, she passed away at the age of 1924 when she was 38. And she lived out most of her life in the room of a house in North Portland. 
and she took in piecework and embroidery and sewed and distributed her craft work um, throughout the area. And then she also wrote poetry, and much of her poetry was about her experience sewing and being alone in her room. Um, and this is part of the project. This is a chapbook of her needlework poems specifically. She wrote and published three books, um, and uh, I think it's the first book, Curtains, that has this needlework poem, in, needlework poetry in it. And this is the work that I focused on, and um, how Shannon and I started working together was we took the stitching poems, cut them up, and sat down together and reassembled a series of poems together. And then I took those poems and stitched them just onto canvas, cotton canvas. Um, and that's how this happened. I was testing out sentences that I had programmed in to make sure that the spelling was correct. And, and then this ended up being kind of the, the foundation for the book itself um, and the, the cover for the, for the book, uh, for the portfolio. So this um, piece of fabric was then taken and put through the press. Um, mm. There are several artists in Portland, um, Barb Tettenbaum at the Oregon College of Arts and Crafts specifically that has worked with pressure printing. And so that's what this technique is. You take the, the fabric um, and you, you know, crimp it into the press. You ink the roller, well you ink the roller first, you crimp this in with a piece of paper and then you run this through the press. And the fabric doesn't get inked, but the, the paper does. Uh, it works as kind of like a rubbing wood. Um, so this is, this, this fabric was hand dyed um, and then printed, um, pressure printed with that piece of fabric. Um, so pressure printing is used in all sorts of different ways, and Barb did publish a little uh, a book on on how to do pressure printing. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so this project is a series of chapbooks that are just republished needlework poems, and then an edition of twelve of these special edition portfolios. And um, this is the fabric, it's, this is crinoline. Um, and then this is a pochoir um, stenciled uh, pressure print. So I embroidered on fabric these hands and then ran that through the press and then did the pochoir over the top of it. And what is pochoir? It's it's a fancy way of saying stencil. Oh. <laughs> I can hardly pronounce it myself. But um, so that is that image. Um, and then inside this book are um, the needlework poems in addition to some tipped in pressure prints of hand embroidery by myself and Shannon. Um, what is Barb's last name? Tettenbaum. Tettenbaum. How do we spell that? T-E-T-T? T-E-T-T-E-N-B-A-U-M, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was there a need to get uh, permission from the family or her estate at all, or did, were you able to just do this freely? Yeah, uh -huh. I did this freely, but um, uh, Oregon State University in Corvallis has a press, and they had just recently republished the collected works of Hazel Hall. So all three of her books republished in one collection. So I did reach out to them, told them about the project, and they were happy about it. Um, yeah, so these are um, 
little tipped in images and and then I made a a tapestry with the nine um, cut up poems uh, stitched onto hand dyed pressure printed panels um, and on the back side took one of Hazel Hall's poems called Loneliness and made a polymer plate and printed that on the trunk of this tree which is an image um, that is derived from that poem. She references a, a tree of hands and a moon um, with a feather, a ring feather stitched around. And so that's this image. And again, this is stenciled work and pressure printed, um, pressure printed doily. Um, so this is a, a piece that I, I just finished in 2016. Um, and, you know, it's another way that I've uh, learned to take, you know, um, labor-intensive textiles and uh, print it so that it's, it can become a, a broader, um, more people can see it and reach a broader audience. Um, so these, you know, I can pass these around if people want to look at them too. These are, these are the different poems that have been um, uh, sewn onto the panels. This was the prospectus for this book, which is the poem by Hazel Hall. Um, if you want to look at these. Yeah, these are on canvas. These are on canvas, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I have just another minute or should we wrap it up? Huh? Clap now, okay. <laughs>